When it comes to monuments of the American Revolution, there's a bit of a difference between those monuments and the monuments that were erected after the Civil War. And there's a couple of reasons to this. Number one, after the Civil War, veterans organizations formed into regimental units, which went around the country erecting monuments on all the Civil War battlefields. And after the Revolution, they didn't have that ability to do that. There were no organizations that were founded. Plus, Revolutionary War battlefields are much smaller in scale and scope than the Civil War battlefields. There's a third reason. Third reason is that after the Civil War, American industry was able to quickly convert from casting bronze cannons into making bronze statues. The United States in its early years didn't have the industrial capacity to do those kinds of things. When it comes to monuments of the American Revolution, like all military memorials across the United States, particularly where there's a human representation in the monument, there are three basic categories that they fall into. There is first the portrait sculpture, which is simply the portrait of the individual. And in the years prior to the Civil War, in the 1840s and 1850s, the United States was erecting portrait sculptures mostly to George Washington. You had Thomas Ball statue in Boston, you had Thomas Crawford statue in Richmond, you had Clark Mills' statue to Washington in Washington, D.C. There's a second category of monuments. After the portrait sculpture, there's the allegorical sculpture, which using human representational figures represents ideas. Daniel Chester French's Minuteman statue at Concord, Massachusetts is the best example of an allegorical figure. It is a figure that represents a Minuteman. It is not to a specific person, so it represents the idea of the Minuteman. And then you have the portrait allegorical sculpture, which is like the monument behind me, the Princeton Battle Monument, which combines elements of a portrait of George Washington with allegorical figures representing various themes, such as you've got a continental drummer boy, you've got a figure of liberty. In fact, this monument, dedicated in 1922 by the sculptor Frederick McMonies, is a Beaux Arts style monument. Frederick McMonies, a student of the great American sculptor Augustus St. Gaudens, was trained in Paris. And this monument in particular has a deeply Parisian import on it. It is based on two works of French art, Eugene Delacroix's painting, Liberty Leading the People, and Francois Rude's Le Departure, which is on one of the sides of the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. It's a large scale bas-relief sculpture, which is sometimes referred to as Washington snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. And it shows the moment at the Battle of Princeton in which Washington turns the tide. The greatest monument of the American Revolution resides in the Virginia State House in Richmond, Virginia. It is a monument to George Washington that was sculpted in 1785 by the greatest living sculptor of the age, Jean-Antoine Houdin who was contracted by the American minister to France, Thomas Jefferson, to come to Mount Vernon, make a life cast of George Washington's face, and then craft a magnificent sculpture of Washington as the American Cincinnatus, which you can find in the central chamber of the Virginia State House. Unlike biographers or historians who get hundreds of pages to tell their story, a sculptor gets one shot to tell the life of that person. And that's what makes these monuments historical narratives on the American landscape.